Hello and welcome to About Books. Coming up on this edition, Ed Critchley speaks with writer, lecturer and nature photographer Rupert Soskin about his book, Metamorphosis. Later in the show, Tim Quinn visits Crosby Writers Circle as they celebrate their 70th anniversary. First tonight, Rupert Soskin. His lifelong passion for natural history led him to pursue his research into geology, archaeology, anthropology and evolutionary psychology particularly into the animal intelligence and the similarities between man and animals. He recently spoke with Ed Critchley about his passions, interests and current book. Today we're going to be talking to Rupert Soskin about this amazing book, Metamorphoses. The exciting thing about this book is there are some world exclusive in there, so we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Hi Rupert, so welcome Hi. today. Um, you. So your book, Metamorphoses, First of all, why, why the title Metamorphosis? Well, it's the, the most astonishing thing about insects is that uh, the complete change in, in, a, in so many cases, complete change from something that you wouldn't recognise the adult as being the same as, uh, as you know, what actually came out of an egg. You know, everyone knows that caterpillars change to butterflies. But uh, you know, if you hadn't, si if you didn't know about that transition, you wouldn't know that one was the other. And going through the whole of the insect world and seeing how that metamorphosis takes place is just amazing. I mean, having looked at the book and seen some of the photographs, just tell us a little bit about the environment to create for this book, because um, I imagine this must have taken an inordinate amount of time and been painstaking to, to get these shots. Um, well, in, in all, it was a four-year project. About three years of that was the photography. And... Um, Basically, the only way to capture, because you know, if you see the pictures in the book, there's um, as far as possible. I've tried to get you know a photograph of something emerging from an egg, and then the, the molts, because every insect will molt a certain amount of times during its development before it becomes an adult. And so, to actually show how that molt takes place and how it might be different after each molt in some cases. So, because I needed to capture those moments. You know, you can't, for example, with a tropical creature, you can't follow something around the jungle for a month waiting for it to uh, do something because, you know, it might climb up to the top of a tree. And um, uh, so the only way to do it was to um, have uh, completely controlled environments in my studio. Yeah. Uh, so they were temperature controlled, light controlled, humidity controlled, so that for any creature, whether it came from South America or Malaysia or wherever, that I could, uh, as far as the insect was concerned, it was just living in the wild. Yeah. And uh, you know, another tricky one was getting the right plants as well, because it's all very well having them there, but you know, also had to be the sort of plants that they needed to live with as well. So uh, that was, you know, that the logistics were enormous to get that in place. But then I would just spend an awful lot of time watching and waiting and. Uh, photographing the moments as they occurred. But why insects? Because your previous book was on megalithic Britain um, <laughs> and, and things like standing stones. So yeah. what, what was your interest in insects? What created the uh, desire to make well, such a my, book? My main work really is, uh, is natural history and wildlife photography, nature photography. Um, megaliths is a, is a big passion of mine and uh, rather than day job. And... Uh, what I love to do in my work, what really makes me want to get up in the morning is is sharing, you know, things that I'm really enthusiastic about. I'm like a kid in a sweet shop, really. It's uh, that there are so many things that people don't know very much about, mm. and particularly, you know, metamorphosis, that, you know, what kicked me off on this, the thing that gave me the idea in the first place, was I was out uh, just photographing stuff generally it was one of those days when just you know go out and see what you see yeah and i found a caterpillar that i didn't recognize just pretty uh, caterpillar uh, so i photographed it <coughs> um just to i'll identify it later on yeah. well i got home and i couldn't identify it. it wasn't in any of my books so i went online and i was trawling all the specialist sites I couldn't find what this was. So I sent the photograph to entomologists that i know and they didn't know what it was and um uh, in the end, I just had to put it in my folder of don't know, because, you know, you can't sell a photograph if you don't know what it is. And it was two years later that, by chance, I stumbled across a photograph of the caterpillar yeah. on a, a Lepidopterist 
website. And, uh, and the thing was, it was, it looked like that. The reason nobody had known what it was was it looked like that for one week in its entire development. Right. It, mol- you know, it looked like this, then it molted and looked like that, and then it molted and it didn't look like that anymore. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there are photographs in here of, of, of things that have never been captured on film before. Yeah, there's so. one, one species in there in particular that, um, uh, that scientifically very little is known about, uh, about them at all. And it's, it's actually a species of fly. Uh, so it doesn't sound particularly gram- glamorous, but uh, it's a species of fly that, um, that the larvae, the young, make pits in the ground and, and they lie in wait at the bottom of the pit yep. uh, for you know, anything that falls in. They will uh, grab it and suck the life out of it. Um, and there are, uh, there are other creatures that do that, but it's the only species or the only family of flies that uh, do this, and I found it quite by chance. I was actually looking for, there's some critters called antlions that uh, people uh, know more about, uh, that uh, they make pits and catch ants, and that's what I was looking for, and I dug up a load of pits just to capture these things and uh, and take them into the studio to rear them uh, in there, and uh, and found that, that all these pits that I'd excavated, I'd sieved the sand to get them out so I could move them. And, uh, and out of 15 pits, I had four creatures. And so I just thought, well, okay, all, all the rest were empty pits. And I just had this bucket of sieved sand. And, uh, and the following day, uh, I came back into the studio and this bucket that had just been sieved sand had pits in it. So the creatures were obviously small enough to fall through the sieve. And uh, so it took me a while of sieving with finer and finer mesh until I actually got these tiny things right. out. Um, and yeah, it's the first time that their life cycle has been um, photographed. Yeah. So yeah. It just gives an idea of scale because you obviously use macro photography. I mean, yeah. the, the pictures are stunning and there's detail. These things are like aliens or something yeah. from another planet, yeah. but I suspect are probably the size of a pinhead. and. Just, just tell us about the photography and the challenges to photograph such tiny, mm. tiny little critters. I mean, through the book, there's there's real extremes. I mean, at, at, at the other end, uh, there's um, the uh, uh, the giant atlas moth, which is one of the biggest moths in the world. So you've got yeah. these big ones as well, where the caterpillars are you know, the, the size of a small cucumber. You know. <laughs> um, but down at the extreme macro end, uh, there are creatures that, I mean, that fly, for example, that I told you about. So the young are living in pits in the ground, yeah. catching what comes in. Well, when they hatch, I've never found their eggs. Um, I've never seen their eggs because they're so small, they're not significantly a lot bigger than a grain of sand that they're actually in with. Um, and uh, what's extraordinary, there's photographs in the book of um, a pit of this very young lava, the, the pit is a millimetre across. And that means that the creature is living inside that and it's waiting for prey to fall into it. So clearly there is prey that's small enough to fall into a pit that's only a millimetre across. You know, you, you see a lot of photographs of tiny things that they might be dead, for example, so they're not moving. Yeah. Um, but that's okay, you can control that. But when a creature is moving, the depth of field, so the amount that's actually in focus, is tiny. It can, mm. it can be, I mean, you know, there are photographs in there, for example, where there's an egg that's a millimetre across, and one side is in focus and the other side isn't. So, um, right. you know, that, that's how much field you have to play with. Um, tell us about your most difficult or humorous shot, because there's one or two uh, in there that are well, quite entertaining. Probably the worst. Um, was during 2012. The, the, the creatures in the, the other ones that I mentioned briefly that live in pits and eat ants, yes. ant lions. So these things, they look, like, uh, they look like creatures from a horror movie when you yeah. um, get them out of the soil. And uh, so they live in these pits and when they pupate from young to adult form, they emerge as they're nocturnal adults. And 
Uh, so what I had to do was uh, I, I had them in the controlled environment in the studio and I had five of them in 2012. They have a two-year life cycle, so I've been rearing them for a couple of years. And uh, uh, so I, uh, when they get ready to pupate, they collapse the pit. So the mm. sand just collapses in and you've got this flat uh, layer of sand. And you, you know that uh, they emerge as adults in about a month. Now, because of the vagaries of anything in nature, you know, it's like human babies. They can come early, they can come late. Yeah. And so you know that it's an average month so they might come in uh, three weeks. They might come in five weeks. Yeah. So I started watching at three weeks, and uh, and you then sit and wait. And I had to stay up all night because they emerge yeah. during yeah. the night. And it could be two o'clock in the morning that I'd run to go to the toilet quickly um, after days or nights and nights of watching, and uh, and it would have emerged in the minute and a half that I'd run out to go to the loo. <laughs> yeah. And that happened with all of them in the first year, not just when I'd gone to the loo, but, uh, uh, but you know, for the same sorts of reasons, I'd missed everyone, and I had to do the whole thing again yeah. the following year. Having read the book, I have a complete new insight into the inset world. Thank you for your time. It's a fantastic book. The photography is stunning, and uh, I'm sure many people will come to enjoy it. Crosby Writers Club was founded in 1946 and 2016 is their 70th anniversary. It's a non-profit making cultural group and holds regular twice monthly meetings. They welcome all those who write or who wish to write. The club exists to help and encourage members in writing for publication, aiming to give constructive criticism and market suggestions. Tim Quinn visited the Writers Club for About Books to find out more. June Francis. Hello. Hello. You have a book coming out. I do. Um, tell us about the book. The book? It's one in my series. I've been writing about the 50s, set in the 50s. And they've all got titles of the songs popular at the time. Many a Tear has yes, to many fall. Many a Tear, yes. I remember it well. You c I can have to sing it, sing yes, the title. Yes. Um, what's the theme of the book? Well, of course, it's about love and emotions. Mm. And it's set mainly in Liverpool. It actually starts in London, but it's, um, it's set mainly in Liverpool. When you started writing the first book, what was the first book? My very first book I wrote was called Beloved Dub Dub Dun, and that was for Mills and Boone's Historical. Oh, really? Yes. But it wasn't my first book published. The one that was published first was the second one, and that was called The Bride Price, and it was set mainly in Wales, okay. in North Wales. How would you describe your writing? Is it romance? Is it high romance? I, no romance? I used to be a member of the RNA, the Romantic Novelists Association. Right. But um, so I, I did start writing romance. I think there's a bit of romance in mo most books, even in crime. I've got at the moment in my spare time, I read um, crime fiction from mm. the golden age of detective fiction, the 30, 30s, 20s, and 30s. And even in those where you've got murders, there's always a bit of romance in the book. Yeah, so. Following the characters in Many a Tear Has to Fall, yes. going back through your other books, yes. um, how many books have used those characters, those same characters? So how many books have there been with those same characters? Well, Maggie, she actually appeared in um, about four or five books back. So four or five books back? Did yeah. you actually plot out four or five books ahead or have they grown oh, no, in the writing? No. To get out. Well, before before this one, I had I actually had um, some character some of the characters, and sometimes what I take is a sister or a cousin or a brother, and write their story because I get so interested in what's going on in mm. their world mm. that I want to write their story and see what happens next. Do the characters take over, take you over, as it were? Um, or Up to a point, but not completely, because yeah. you have your own life as well, so you've got to live, you live in both worlds. Yeah. Many a Tear Has to Fall is, mm. is um, 
published in when is it May? May? It's coming out then. No, it's coming out the end of this month. March. So it's out yeah. in March. Yeah, Excellent. It's the end of in all good yeah. bookshops, as we yes, say. Yes. Fantastic. That's yes, something to look so. look out for. Yeah. You remember of. Crosby Writers yes. Circle. How long have you been coming here? For 30 here? years. For 30 years, really? Yes. yes. Uh, what do you get out of these meetings? Well, I've got lots of friends here who are interested in the similar things that I am. Mm. And I also come because I want to um, pay back, you know, give back what the club sure. has given me. Because yeah. I don't, I believe I wouldn't have succeeded without the club. Really? Yes, yes. Well, the best of luck with the new Thank book you. and many more to come. Thank you. First of all, happy anniversary. Thank you. The 70th anniversary of the Crosby Writers Club. Goodness me, that's many a year. Um, what are the aims of the club? To get people um, published. People who want to write, people who do write, our aim is that they should be published. And a typical meeting involves what? what would go down during a typical meeting here? Well, as you've seen tonight, we have manuscripts that the members bring in and they read. And usually we, we try to criticise them and then, you know, try to perhaps say, well, we'd have done it this way. And also we discuss markets. Are they going to send it off or is it just for personal use and so on? What type of work is produced here? What, what type of writing? I mean, is we, it... We Very do all good. kinds of writing. We have poetry, we write journalistic articles, we have short stories, novel openings for anybody who is that way inclined. Um, we do one-act plays. We even do the shortened versions of stories. What might call words. flash fiction. 100 words, 500 words. We cover the whole gamut. You've brought in quite a few guests over the years. Um, can you name a few of those? Tim Quinn. Ah, oh, he was good. <laughs> They're still talking about him. Roger, well, Roger Phillips. Roger Phillips. Yes. BBC Beryl Radio Beryl Radio Beryl Bainbridge. Beryl Bainbridge. Beryl Bainbridge. Yes. yes. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, Roger McGough. Roger McGough. Right. Mm -hmm. And others. How, how do you go about joining? There's people well, here and the names keep we, coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. We, we actually have a uh, what we would class as a visitor tonight. Yeah. And, yeah. and they hear about us, they might read our syllabus in the library or something, and they will come along to a meeting and meet us. And we explain to them that we like them to come for at least three meetings, mm. see if we are what they are looking for. Uh, because some people think we teach them. Mm. Well, we don't teach writing. They come to us. Obviously, you learn as you go along how to present your work and so on. And June is a great mentor. We owe her a, a great debt, really. You know, she, she's famous. She's a prolific writer. And she could say, well, you know, bye-bye to Crosby mm. Writers, but she doesn't. Mm. She comes along to every meeting. Mm. So we all benefit from her experiences. But as I say, we say, come three times if we're what you, you, we are what you're looking for join and then when they bring manuscripts in they can read them out mm. only until then 70th anniversary um any plans to celebrate through this year yes we have we're going down to the royal and we're going to have a meal and also we have had a poetry competition running which will be judged by gladys mary coles and in the autumn we're going to produce an anthology of work from every body in the club mm. and see how that goes. That sounds fantastic. 70 years from now, this will still be here? This will still be yes. here, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Marie Hudson. Yes. I believe you're the longest serving member of the Crosby Writers Club. Um, can you tell us about when you joined? How did you come to join this I place? I came to live in Crosby in 1974 mm. and I'd never been uh, I'd been in a smaller club at a house in Crewe where we lived for seven years. I came back and went to Crosby Library, looked on the board at what was possible to be in, because I was a, a stay-at-home mum. Right. But I wanted to do something that, apart from 
housework. And I saw the little syllabus card and the lady, the secretary, was called Frieda Collins. And it said, ring Frieda Collins if you're interested. I rang her in the, in the, the, end of, the beginning of August 1974 and she said, come along and see if it's what you like. I came and I met a lady called Heather Trencher and she'd just won a short story competition. And she said, this is my first time here. And I said, it, I, it's my first time. Well, they judged this short story and actually she won the competition, but there were some very, very good entries. And I thought, I, I'm not going to stay here because I'm out of my depth, to be honest. Because they seemed, there was Marjorie Wynne and Stella Johnson, and some very, very good writers mm. published. Because in those days, these, you know, there was a lot of ladies' magazines, mm. so they got a lot published. You were writing yourself at this time. Had you always only, been a Only writer? as a hobby. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was well, a hobby. I couldn't give counts. up the day job. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I said to Heather, she said, would you, if I join, would you join? So anyway, to cut a long story short, we said we'd join. We'd come to about three meetings, and if it wasn't what we wanted, um, we'd leave. So I said, I'll stay for three meetings, and I ended up staying 14 years. Excellent. And it don't seem a day too long. It doesn't. <laughs> the longest serving member, can uh, uh, you, I imagine, have many memories and maybe much information about the origins of the club, going way back, well, 70 years now, isn't it? It is. Um, what well, do you know of the formation well, of happened, the club? what Ma happened, apparently, Marjorie Wynne, who came to the club, incidentally, until she was into her 90s, mm. and she was a, 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 almost a founder member, because I believe her and Stella Johnson, who got, the, 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 I think they met in a, a pub, they in a, in a room in a pub, okay. and there was about four up. There was Stella Johnson and a lady called um, Turner, a lady, uh, another lady. I can't remember her name. Am I Taylor. Am I Beatrice right? Taylor. Am I right in uh, that Arthur Johnson of the Liverpool Echo? Yes. Was it his mother? It or? was his mother. Ah. Yes. Okay. It was his mother. He has been as a speaker here, actually. Right. So he he remembers. You know, it was the Beatles here, and he remembers those days. Uh, yeah. yeah. We all remember those remember days. Those. those are great days. Well, yeah. Stella Johnson and Marjorie Wynne decided that um, there was enough people interested. Uh, and then, I don't know who the next lady, well, there was a lady called Beatrice Taylor and another lady called Mrs Taylor. Mm. And then they decided to try and get the small hall in the uh, Civic Hall. Right. When, I think the Civic Hall was just quite new. Mm. But up till then, I think they met either in the, in the pub or at one of the houses, I think at one of the houses. Right. And they decided then to properly form. Crosby Writers Club. Fantastic. So, Fantastic. and that was that first one is the the, the 25th anniversary in 1971. Oh, fantastic! Okay, yeah. well, Marie, thank you for those memories. Thank you for watching this episode of About Books. We'll see you next time. <laughs>